The American Public Health Association is committed to improving public health and achieving equity in health status. This year, we are incredibly excited to welcome all our members back, virtually and in person, to Denver to share the latest in research and public health leadership. This is APHA TV. We are back at APHA 2021 for more of the very latest in public health research and conversations. Today, we feature a number of institutions working toward innovative research in community health and policy. A wrap up from the Monday general session with Lisa Macon Harrison and Dr. J. Nadine Gracia. We are engaged in uh, both policy and advocacy as it relates to strengthening the nation's health system. But first, over to our co-host, Dina Baer, for a conversation with Kelly O'Brien about her work in advocacy and social connectedness. We'd now like to welcome Kelly O'Brien, moderator of the featured session, Advocacy and Social Connectedness, Communities Leading the Charge. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. So I think when people hear the word advocacy, they have different meanings in their head. A lot of people think it means, you know, lobbying Congress, and that might make them shy away. So I want to first talk about that word advocacy, what it means to you, and why it's so important that people get involved. Yeah, thanks. That's a really good question, especially um, during this time where I feel like a lot of people can feel kind of helpless um, with so much going on, right? But advocacy is, I, I think of advocacy just like you would think about being an advocate for a friend or a parent, right? It's, it's really an umbrella term that means um, fighting for a cause or for a person, right? So it's just about supporting something that you believe in, but it's really an umbrella term. And lobbying is a more narrow, specific legal definition that was just set up really to protect all of us. And lobbying simply means a direct request of a legislator to vote or um, express an opinion about a particular piece of legislation in one way or another. So if you want people to be passionate, I think the best way to do that is to talk about your successes in advocacy. Yeah, so there's a lot of successes that we've seen. If you think about um, some of the big ones in the last decade are marriage equality. That's a great one, right? A lot of progress on climate change, right? Think about the young people in particular that have stood up as advocates. Um, there's a lot of advocacy happening right now around abortion laws, right, on both sides of the issue. So I think, you know, there's advocacy in the micro, right, in our everyday lives, and then there's advocacy in the big collective, but we all have a role and a part to play. In, in a simple level, voting is advocacy. You know, when you vote, you're an advocate. I know in your case, you're very involved with Alzheimer's. What have been some of the greatest challenges when it comes to advocacy? Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges when it comes to Alzheimer's advocacy is that people think that, I mean, there's a lot of stigma about getting older. You know, there's a, a, a sense of, well, this is just what happens to people. And, and so building the energy around, no, that's not. And I think, um, so there's been a, a sense of um, culture shift around the way we think about getting older that's been a battle. Um, I think um, fighting for research dollars. So there's a lot of uphills, but there's a lot of wins, right? There's a lot of exciting opportunities for people whose interest you have piqued, even in this brief conversation. Yeah. Is there any advice that you would have for people to start to get involved? Yeah, I'll, you know what? I think about the story of Jan Schakowsky, Representative Jan Schakowsky, who's now a um, federal legislator. She started as a mother who was advocating because she wanted expiration dates on the back of milk cartons. So the lesson in that for me is that you can be your own light. Like, you don't have to have a lot of money or a huge organization. Each individual has things that they care about. And by standing for those things, whether it's a tweet that you put out on social media or a conversation you have with a friend or a group that you meet with at church, you can really make a difference by using your voice. Yes. So I would say, just, you know, say what you think, like stand up for what you believe. And you're by definition an advocate. Just get involved, and you're a wonderful right. inspiration for thank that. You. Kelly O'Brien, thank you so much. Thanks. APHA TV is brought to you from the 2021 APHA Annual Meeting. You can find us in person at the Colorado Convention Center, in select hotels, and on the homepage of the meeting platform, as well as on our YouTube channel and Twitter feed. Center for the Study of Community Health at UAB is a CDC-funded prevention research center. 
and every five years we have a research project. This five-year project is called CHEER, Community Health Through Engagement and Environmental Renewal. The purpose of this is to try to get into the communities and have them be empowered to improve their communities. It is the sense of uh, bringing in uh, the community, engaging them for the purpose of increasing and for improving health. The conditions of the neighborhood, they do a lot to harm the neighborhood. Without having intervention on a regular basis, it slowly deteriorates the neighborhood. So we wanted to do some things to bring that spirit back, taking care of our own communities. Really the mission of the center and our, our project is community improvement. We want to make Birmingham neighborhoods the greatest that we can and make it the most livable place for residents. Now over to the College of Health, Community and Policy at the University of Texas, whose aim is to develop solutions for improving well-being all around the world. About four years ago, the president and the provost decided that it would be nice to take the social science related disciplines that focus on health and policy and pull them together in one college. So the college was named the College for Health, Community and Policy. Our mission is to improve the health and well-being of the community, whether that be the San Antonio community, the state as a whole, the nation, or even the world. And we plan to do that via community engagement. It's been really exciting to now be a part of a new college and being a part of the discussions to develop that because I can see where we're making strides in being the leader on campus and really setting the tone for what education, research, service can look like for the region. As a native San Antonian, my hope for the future of the city of San Antonio is really improved public health and health equity. No matter what area of town you're born on or what your background is, that everybody has an equal chance for a life that has value and a high quality of life. The COVID-19 pandemic demonstrated how years of underinvestment and disinvestment in the public health infrastructure has crippled our ability to address emerging health threats. With Lisa Macon Harrison and Dr. J. Nadine Gracia, join us from Denver for a recap of the session. We've seen how the pandemic really has exposed um, the weaknesses in our public health system that are really long-standing and due to, in many parts uh, and in many ways, the chronic underfunding of public health. So Trust for America's Health, we are engaged in uh, both policy and advocacy as it relates to strengthening the nation's health system. And we have a focus in particular on prevention and public health and ensuring that we have a 21st century public health system that is able to meet the health threats and ongoing health threats that we face as a nation. When you say the word infrastructure, it means different things to different people. And we've talked a lot at APHA and at other places where we're having discussions about the future of public health about infrastructure, about workforce, um, making sure that we have the tools that we need in our toolbox to do our work better, faster, and stronger. For example, we're advocating for the Public Health Infrastructure Saves Lives Act, which would provide $4.5 billion annually uh, to support public health, providing support at the federal, state, and local level, where state and local um, health departments would be able to get grants to support their ability to engage in these cross-cutting capabilities from disease surveillance uh, to communications, to policy development, community partnerships, and assure that the competencies and accountability are present for, for public health to be able to do its job most effectively and most efficiently. It's a time to be hopeful and optimistic about the future of public health. You know, for so many years, public health has really had this um, cloak of invisibility. Now people are more familiar with the work of public health. So that makes me more hopeful that with the funding that we do have opportunities to access in the next five to 10 years, that local public health will not be forgotten in the mix. I was absolutely starstruck this morning by all of the, the panelists and the people in the audience alike who are here to celebrate the work of public health. It feels really good to be among, among our community. Now let's head over to the Center for Innovation in Population Health at the University of Kentucky to hear more about their innovative approaches for improving population health.
The Center for Innovation and Population Health, we call it the IF Center, is in What If. Our effort is to give voice to the least privileged people in the world so that they have full voice in their care, so we can help them to change our lives. So the mission is to engineer person-centered care to make people who receive help full partners in their care. So we use a theory called transformational collaborative outcomes management, focused on personal change, not on service delivery or access to care, focus on change, the impact of our work, and focus on using collaboration as a way of managing complexity. Starting with the assessment of what's going on in their lives and following all the way through to system level planning so that we're using the stories of the people we serve to drive system change. Let's head back to Denver now to hear what you have found most interesting about the meeting so far. I'm most excited about the round tables as well as um, the oral presentations. I really want to hear what people are doing around health disparities, especially during the pandemic and how that really uh, you know, panned out. I look forward to share the results of my own research and interact with my peers and learn from their experiences as well. I'm looking forward to learning about a bunch of different things. Um, it's always a great place to kind of broaden your horizons in public health, not just your own kind of specialty. Every year just there are different themes, different updates, keynote addresses. First conference post-COVID in two years, I'm excited. Everyone's social distancing, we're fist bumping, elbowing, which is great, and everyone has their masks, which makes me feel very safe. Now to the Department of Health Policy and Management at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health, where their research projects are directly impacting policy and practice. HBM is impacting policy and public health from climate to democratic rights. It's about creating a bigger community than just the one that you find yourself in. We work with faculty and peers every day to translate research into policy. Policy typically changes inch by inch, shaped by research, shaped by smart people trying to do the right thing. We try to give them a toolkit, how to respond, you know, when unexpected things happen, how to respond to a pandemic. As a state senator now, I used what I learned in my public health program every single day. We work with the students to say, well, given these findings, what policy would you recommend? I just love putting the tools into the hands of our really passionate students. They teach me and I teach them and we have uh, a collaborative relationship. They come to me with questions of like, how can we change healthcare? I'm so inspired by their enthusiasm. That's it from us for today. Don't forget to come back tomorrow though as Dina hosts interviews with APHA incoming president, Dr. Kay Bender on rural health plans and plans for APHA's 150th anniversary and much more. Remember, you can always find us here in the Colorado Convention Center as well as in select hotels, always on the virtual platform and find us online. Goodbye for now. <laughs>